Welcome, uh, big audience, and uh, it's my very pleasure to have Professor Dorong Palait uh, from uh, Bar Ilan University from Israel to be here to give a talk on first order temporological monitoring with BDDs. So, uh, Professor Palait is very well known in, uh, in the field of form methods. He is the cover world winner for his uh, significant contribution in partial order reduction. If you know partial order reduction, <coughs> it's a technique to efficiently reduce the search space. It's a super intelligent method, which where the inventor is here. And previously, he was studying his career in Bell Labs, and then as a professor in Huawei, and now in his factory sphere. So I leave the rest of time to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about random verification, in particular about first order temporal logic monitoring with DVDs. This is a joint work with Klaus Havelund from NASA, JPL, and with Dogan Ulus, uh, who is from uh, Verimac. And that's uh, actually a concurrent talk because Klaus is invited to give this talk in LTA uh, today. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to put it on YouTube. Yeah, right? and it would be on YouTube. It would be on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it today. <laughs> you can compare and yeah. see. <laughs> well, the slides are not exactly the same. Okay, so what is runtime verification? So suppose you um, manufacture something like a car or, or some kind of a spacecraft or, or like a traffic uh, lights junction and that complicated. And uh, usually what they do is model checking. So we want to thoroughly check that, that the system satisfies what it's supposed to do. Or the model of the system um, and of course, there's all kinds of problems because we're, we're actually just checking the model, not the system itself. Uh, and, and there are complexity problems. So after checking that, it does not mean that the, it's really a very thorough check. It is, you know, um, as good as, you know, um, as good as it get with, with the resources you have, right? So usually you model the system, you abstract it, it's, it's kind of a reduced version, it's a part of it. Uh, so suppose you generated the system and you already made all the checks and the tests and the model, model checking, verification, everything. Still, there can be errors. So what we propose, runtime verification. Uh, what's the pointer now? This time. Uh, so what does runtime verification does? So it follows the execution of the system, say it's a car, uh, during the execution, and uh, it compares what it does to some kind of a temporal property, and then it issues a warning uh, telling you if something went wrong or, or maybe if something is good. Okay. Uh, it is limited over model checking. Model checking. Uh, checks a uh, finite state system, uh, but it checks infinite executions, so executions whose size is, is not limited. Um, Runtime verification just checks what it saw, so it checks the prefix of the execution, okay? Uh, and it checks, in fact, one execution, so you can follow several executions if you run the system in parallel. You can take several cars and then check what they do, but it checks each time one execution. Still, I think it's very powerful. In particular, uh, my friend Klaus Avalon, who is a co-author of this paper, is interested uh, in that for NASA because when uh, we send the mission, or NASA sends a mission, okay, it wants to see that it does what it wants. And I think the philosophy of NASA of uh, correctness is that it just follows what the mission does. And if something goes wrong, uh, the engineers, the programmers, uh, what they do is they try their hardest uh, to, to make the spacecraft do the following. It should change its position such that it gets light from the sun, so the batteries get recharged, and it resets uh, to get some new software from Earth, okay? So runtime verification is very important to initiate this process, right? To figure out that you need to do that kind of stuff. 
So, uh, just to give some kind of intuition of, of what's going to happen, uh, is, is it possible to fix this battery and anyway? Because it's very useful to point. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let's look at some temporal properties. I assume you all know temporal properties, right? So, so here I have this property, always P implies eventually Q, okay? So say P is that the file is open and Q is the file is closed, okay? Maybe it's the same file, okay? And I want to check that this happened, okay? Run the verification, I try, you know, I instrument the code such that I get information about every state or, or every few seconds I get some information and the information tells me whether P happened in that state and whether Q happened in that state, okay? So I'm trying to do this runtime verification and at some point I see that P happens, okay? Uh, then what it says is you have to guarantee that Q happens. But maybe in every prefix that they try, Q did not happen yet, okay? I don't know if this property is, is going to be satisfied or not. It could be, but it could be not, right? And if this is not model checking, I don't have a model of the system, I just observe what is happening. So this is kind of a property that probably I don't want to do runtime verification to. I, I, don't, I don't want to follow. You know, I can follow, but um, even if Q happen, uh, later there could be another P, and again, I'm not going to see whether the next Q would happen, or you know, maybe I'm lucky, and Q happened like every, uh, you know, it happened two steps after the Q, okay? But this, this is kind of a problematic thing. What I mean to say here is that there are some properties for which runtime verification is problematic because what I see always is the prefix, okay? Uh, another point, um, should I assign different P's and Q's if I want to say if I open a file and eventually I close a file, so should I have lots of P's and lots of Q's, right? So the point here is that I want to make it parametric. And this is propositional temporal logic, and what I want to motivate is that I'm going to have first order temporal logic, right? That would have parameters, and so I can match the files that I open and the files that I close. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, so this is the second point. Uh, I really want to have like a first order. I want to have quantification and I want to have parameters and values. Okay, let's look at this property. Now, this, this now is, is going to be kind of more positive than this example. I want to follow this property eventually P and I'm going to follow events. I instrumented the code such that I get, you know, my runtime verification environment gets this information. It gets from every state information where the P happened and once P happened then I know that it is satisfied I can go home, I don't have to do the runtime verification anymore, I'm done okay? and here is the other easy and good case uh, it says always Q okay? so I'm going to check the states, I want Q to happen in every state Q is some kind of safety property, you know, it's a junction and I don't have you know, uh, the passengers and the cars being able to walk through the same junction at the same time, okay? And if Q doesn't hold at some point, then, you know, I have a warning and, you know, there would be alarm or I would just, you know, uh, make immediately a red light and change the, uh, I'll, I'm going to change the system or, I don't know, call the policeman to reset the traffic light, okay? So, so these are some just points just to motivate what I want to do. So, uh, what we are interested in is pastime temporal formulas. And the reason I'm interested in pastime temporal formulas, in fact, is motivated in the previous slide. Oops, what's happening? Mm -hmm. It's motivated here, okay? Uh, in fact, what I can check, you know, I have, uh, you know, good information on properties like that. 
properties that says that in every state something happened about the past, or properties like that. This is a bit less, in, less interesting. This, this is that something already happened, okay? But this is kind of a safety property. You know, I want to check for safety property because I see only prefixes all the time. I see prefixes, I'm not going to see the future. And this is like co-safety property. It says already something is satisfied. Yes. Uh, just a question about these prefixes. Are, are they bounded or there's no assumption? They're not bounded. They're not bounded. They're not bounded. Yes, that's a good question. And, and I have to take care of that, right? So there's actually lots of alternating algorithms with different complexities. And sometimes I'm willing to pay the complexity and have slightly uh, less complexity uh, per state in order that uh, I'll have finite amount of memory for unbounded prefixes, whether you know I can have you know faster work per state, but goes unbounded, unbounded becomes infinite memory. Very, very good question. Yes. Okay, I hope I get the the yeah. Yep. So runtime verification. Uh, we can alarm against violation of safety properties. That was the motivation of, of that example. Always Q and code safety. That was the eventually uh, property. Uh, and the rest of the properties, you know, I can have some partial information. Maybe I can say something about their safety and code safety component. Okay. So. For that, I'm going to work only with safety properties. So I don't want to know that eventually R. I want to know that always Q. And Q is something complicated about the past. So uh, it is known, it's a theory of uh, temporal logic, that all the safety properties can be expressed as a, always as a box and a past property. I'm not going to write the box, the always. I'm going to check in every state a past property. So that's my, my motivation why I do things. And again, I'm going the wrong direction. So here, here are the typical properties that I'm going to use. Um, um, this property says the following. First of all, I also wanted to motivate that I want a first order uh, temporal logic. I want to have some parameters. Like with the files, I, I don't want to have a different P and Q uh, per each file. So I'll have some kind of predicates like close F, and F would be a name of the file, implies, and P is in the past. So P is the past operator, uh, is kind of the uh, mirror of the eventually of the time operator. Okay, so I'm going to have past operator uh, for every file. Uh, if I close the file, then uh, at some point in the past, I open it, okay? And I could actually complicate it a bit. That allows me to close and open it in the same state because in the past also can mean immediately now. The, the now is included in temporal logic in the way I define it at least uh, in the present. So I could say for every file, uh, if I close the file, then in the previous state, so this is the dual of the next state, the previous state, uh, and I would say, actually, I did not close it since I opened it, and since is the dual of the until. Okay, so I have, I'll have pass operators dual to the until. I'm going to define them. Okay, so here's how it works. So I instrumented the code, and I have these events, and, and I get this. Uh, at every time in point that, uh, sorry, in every point in time that uh, something happened, I get some information, and my runtime verification monitors that information, and uh, I start, and then I see an open with a file name, whose name is tell for some reason, I don't know, uh, and then another file is open, another file is open, and then there's a third file. Uh, there's a fourth file, uh, and it is closed, and notice that this is not any one of the files that were open. Okay? So that property is going to not be satisfied, and then I need to issue a warning, right? So uh, what we can learn about that is also that for this property, 
Uh, I would actually need to keep all of the names of the file that I open in order to compare it to that. So the question about uh, the previous question about uh, whether my my execution is bounded. If it's unbounded, I need really a lot of memory, right? So I need kind of unbounded memory, and, and we'll, we'll get to that point. So I assume I have a lot of memory, and, and the uh, sequence is, is very long, but maybe not infinite. But there's also sometimes ways of compacting things, of throwing information that you don't need. This is an example where you cannot throw any information. Uh, well, you can throw information about the properties you, about the files you close, but you need to keep all those that you open because you may compare them here. So here's my logic. Uh, it's, it looks like proposition temporal logic with uh, the operators reversed or, or mirrored. So since is uh, the mirror of until, as I said, and this is the previous time, okay? Uh, but I also have uh, the quantification, so I can say there exists an X, okay, because I have data. I can have predicates, and in the predicates I can have very simple terms. In fact, what I can have inside a predicate is only a constant or a variable name. Okay, so I can have complicated terms. This is my logic, and of course there's a syntactic sugar, uh, this is not sufficient. So I, I also have false, and I have an n, not just an or application. I, I have the dual of exists for all. Uh, I have the past operator. Right? <coughs> so something, sometimes in the past, phi happened. And I, this, this is the dual of the box. This says uh, always in the past. Okay? So this is the mirror of the past. It's actually the dual of, of the previous operator. And this is an operator which actually Klaus uses a lot when he's, you know, in, in NASA when he uses runtime verification. He likes this shorthand that says uh, this, this kind of like a, a semi open interval, which means that uh, not phi 2 since phi 1. And, and it's useful, as you can see, in the following property. Uh, <coughs> so this property says uh, for every user, so user is a variable for every file, uh, the user can access a file if, and then you, you, should, you should read it according to this property, if uh, that user uh, has not logged out since it logged in and did not close the file since it opened the file. This is going to be one of the examples that we're going to test our tool against. So there will be three examples and I will point them out, right? So at the end there will be a table, this would be example number one. What is fun, but, just, uh, uh, but it may still happen that uh, uh, the user logged in, logged out, opened the file and closed the file, I mean in this sequence, right? Yeah. And would that is probably a, a bad behavior because he logged in and then logged out. Uh -huh. And then open the file, then close the file. And you shouldn't open the file if it's not you know. yeah, Maybe well, you, it's, it's not, you know, it's just a property, right? So it's yeah. not a uh, foolproof temporal right. property yeah. against yeah. anything. And it's just an example. Now here's our semantics, and it looks a bit complicated. So I'll try kind of to, to uh, you know, to give the intuition. So what happened is that when you give semantics, then uh, there's the structure on the left and the formula on the right and ex explain how the formula is, or how the structure satisfies the formula. So uh, on the left what we have is a triple and the triple consists of an assignment. The first component is an assignment of uh, values to variables. Okay? Uh, epsilon happens to be the empty assignment okay? and because the formula so the assignment is going to be to the free variables of the formula. So uh, the assignment would, would have you know, different sets of variables, right? So this is, this is the empty assignment. It doesn't assign value to any variable because it does not contain any variable. Uh, this is this is satisfied true. Uh, but if you know if it has to satisfy a formula like phi and psi then notice that there might be free variables 
uh, for phi. So that is the projection of that assignment over the variables of phi, and that is the projection of that assignment over the variables of psi. Okay? So sometimes uh, different parts of the formulas would, would be satisfied by, by assignment for different variables, and then you have to combine them uh, as an assignment to, uh, to uh, more variables. Okay? So the first component is uh, the assignment, and the second component is the sequence that happened so far. Or if you want, it's the entire sequence, it doesn't matter, but let's say this, the sequence that happened so far is the information that uh, the uh, runtime verification tool got. And the third component is obviously the current state. It's a pointer to the current state starting from zero is the last state, it's the last event that happened. Okay, so, um, well, if I want to say that previous time phi happened uh, under that structure, then that means that i is bigger than one, right? So sigma includes more than one state or one event, okay? Uh, and in the Previous event, okay, of sigma, uh, phi was, was uh, happening. Uh, where, when I have three variables, I have to assign them uh, from uh, gamma. Gamma is the assignment to the three variables. Right? So this is it. Uh, semantics. Um, okay, and and for exist, that means that there's a way to uh, replace the variable x by some value a, that would satisfy uh, the formula phi when, when you make the assignment. Um, I, I think this, this is clear. It, it looks like, you know, very garbled, etc. but that's clear semantics. Uh, this, this says that, uh, right, so if you see an event uh, pa, right, and, and the current formula is pa for a constant a, then, then that is satisfied. Uh, and if uh, you see an event PA and the formula that you want to satisfy is PV, uh, then what that does is it ties the value of A to the variable V, right? And, and there's the sense operator here, which has the usual semantics, uh, like in proposition pathology. So let's see something which is going to kind of, I think, a bit buffer us and, and, and show why this is actually complicated. Okay, and, and why the semantics I gave is, well, it's the natural semantics of first order uh, past temporal logic, but it kind of gives us very little information of what to do. So I want to check that property. There exists a Y for which there exists an X, where PX happens is Q of Y. Okay, so well, what that means is that, uh, let me look at Q of x, in this case it's q5, and since I saw it, now I'm, now I'm here, I'm, I'm going to check whether this, this holds here. Since I saw it, um, then there was a p of x that happened throughout the states since I saw it, okay? That means that in every one of these states I, I see p of, of some values, okay? So predicate p some values. But there has to be one P at least, which is mutual to all of them, right? So let's see, six, seven, eight, da, 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 da. there's nothing which is mutual, okay? So you know it's a shift, but da, 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 da. there are four states and each one has only three variables. There's no mutual value that goes on all these states and so the answer is false to that temporal property, right? But, now, um, I extend this example, and I also have Q of 3. So it says there exists a Y for which, right? So uh, maybe this was not true for Q of 5, but maybe this is true for Q of 3, right? Uh, let's see. For Q of 3, if I look at the thing that happens since Q of 3, 1, 2, 3, then the value 9 uh, is mutual. So the answer is yes for q of 3, 
And since that says there exists a Y, then the answer for that formula is yes. Okay? So it's not a very complicated formula, okay? But it says something about, about you know, the intuition of what is happening here. So we need to see that there's, we need to keep track that there's either a common value of P of something since Q of A of phi, or there is some common value since Q of 3. Okay? And, and we need, you know, intuitively you need to, to look at pairs of values, so we need to keep track of the, of the fact that we have Q of 5 here, here, and, and, and what happened here, and, and we need to, to intersect values, and in fact we need to do that separately for the 5 and separately for the 3, right? It's kind of hard work. I would say. Okay. So let's see what, what we do with Q3. So basically what we do is we need to keep pairs. So we remember that we saw a 3 and we pair 3 with 7, 8, and 9. And now we uh, intersect this set with that set. So now the candidates to, to satisfy that property are only 8 and 9 because 7 is gone. And we intersect these values with these values, and now the candidate is 9, and the answer is true for 3, okay? We probably have done the same thing with 5, but then we didn't get any, any luck. But since it's an exist, then the answer is, is yes, it's true, right? So you see that, you know, we keep both the y values, pairs of x values, uh, we have to keep basically lots of pairs, two, two kinds of intersections, one for the three, one for the five. This is the point. The standard semantic does not give us a good intuition how to perform this proof of keeping. Okay? And when we saw that the first time, then we thought, well, this is a really hard problem. How do you calculate that? You need something really, you know, conceptually different uh, that will tell you how to do that. This, this is, you know, if you look at the standard semantics, I, I, I'm not sure how you know, to figure out how to do all these intersections, all these calculations. So, here's another semantics. Okay. It is an equivalent semantics, but it works in a different way. So what they do here is uh, the semantics says the following. It takes a formula. It takes the uh, sequence that happened, and it takes the point in the sequence where I'm interested to observe whether the formula holds or not. And it gives me the set of all the assignments that would satisfy the formula. Okay, so it goes like the other way. Right? Instead of saying that assignment for that sequence, for that point, satisfy the property, it says these are all the assignments that satisfy the property for that sequence uh, for that point. Okay? Uh, so for example, you can see that uh, here it says phi and psi. Then what I need to do is I take all the assignments that satisfy uh, phi at point i of the sequence, and I, I would say now intersect that with all the assignments that satisfy psi at the same point of that sequence, but it's not exactly intersects. In fact, uh, it's, it's a database join. So it is important, there's a subtle point here where uh, I can have uh, different you know, free variables here and different free variables there. You remember that I had that in the original semantics. And then what I needed to do is I needed to kind of uh, make an assignment which includes uh, you know, the union of the variables, right? So, so the join operator, what it does is that if I have some variables here, some assignments and some assignments, uh, for the values, for the variables that do not appear in any side, I assume any value. It's a join, it's a database join. It's defined it as a database join to be consistent with the previous semantic. And this is important to understand the semantics. And in a similar way, uh, this is the dual operator. 
Look, look at the sense operator. The sense operator, right? So it says something about the values now, uh, and you know it's a union of the values previously intersected with uh, calculating uh, the same formula in the previous step. Okay, and again, this is joint operator. This is the tool of the joint operator, and uh, this is the alternative semantics. Okay, so. Uh, so what I wanted just to make the point that this is very very similar to the formulation of that formula, right? So you see the differences are that uh, the union replaces the disjunction and the uh, intersection replaces the conjunction, right? So this is very similar. Uh, and the formula is unsatisfiable if uh there is no assignment vector. Sorry? A formula is unsatisfiable for a prefix. Exactly. So, so uh, and in fact, here, to initiate thing, uh, I assume that at the beginning, that, that uh, yeah, I have a zero, right? So it's the empty set of uh, assignment. And this, right, so true is satisfied by by an assignment, but it's an empty assignment because it does not have any variable. So, so it's, it's very carefully crafted. So you are taking the dual form by considering all the assignments, like maximum uh, maximum satis satisfaction, and then all the way down. Right? Yeah. Okay. And of course, I need to connect that semantics to the previous semantics, and obviously, what happened is that uh, no. I have the assignment. This assignment is part of what satisfies that formula uh, at that point at that sequence, if and only if I have the previous assignment, right? So it satisfies under sigma at point five, at point five, satisfied five, right? So uh, it is equivalent, right? It's important that it's equivalent. But this is a semantics that tells me something. And why? You remember that I had this example where I have all these intersections. And I started with a Y and a different Y's, and I have different intersections for Y equals Y, different intersections for Y equals 3. Now, with that semantics, I can, I can define these things. Now, another point is that this is a complement. And one thing I have to uh, explain, which is important, is that I do not assume a uh, finite domain. So I don't know what values I'm going to, to get. So uh, I think it's important, it's a very nice feature of this work, that uh, I can get files that are open or, or any, any kind of, of data values, and I don't know in advance what they're going to be, you know, that they're, I, I know the type, but I don't know in advance which values are going to have. To, to, to have. They are not restricted, so when I do a complementation, right, like for a not, then I want the complementation to be over all the possible values that I'm going to see. Okay? And that's also, I think, not trivial and we're going to achieve that as well. So, um, just a recap of how I would do uh, things in propositional case. So, if I wanted to calculate phi since psi in the propositional case, right? So, if I have just propositional uh, temporal logic, what I would do? I would check if, um, right, so I would check several things. I would check whether psi already holds in the current state. And if psi already holds in the current state, then I'm done. Because phi is since psi is satisfied. And if not, then I'm going to check whether phi holds in the current state. And I'm going to check whether in the previous state phi since psi holds. Okay? Uh, and uh, this is actually a, a manifestation of, of the following formula, right? So this holds if either psi holds now or phi holds and previously phi since psi. So in fact, temporal logic or past temporal logic has the nice property that if I want to calculate, if I want to do the runtime verification, then it is sufficient for me to basically summarize things and keep information about the truth values of the subformulas 
of the current state and in the previous state. It is enough. And that also, again, answers your question of what happens if it's in, you know, unbound in sequence. I only need to keep information about the current state and the previous state. Okay? And why I'm showing that? Because uh, this is true for propositional temporal logic, and I, I, I want to, to have something that looks like that uh, for the first order quantum verification. This is important. Okay? So now let's look again at the semantics and let me highlight uh, this. What, what this says, this is again my since form, formula, right? And in this new semantics, the set semantics, which is equivalent to the original semantics, and he says that what I need to calculate is I need to calculate the set of assignments that satisfy psi of the current state, right? I do this union, which is actually, it's not exactly a union, right? So it's a data based kind of union. Uh, and the intersection, or actually it's a join, of the assignment satisfying phi in the current state and the assignment satisfying uh, phi since psi in the previous state. So I also need only to keep sets of what? It will be sets of tuples now, not sets of propositions. But I, I need to keep sets of tuples uh, now from the current state and from the previous state, and this is enough. Okay? Since my domain is not bounded, it could be that this set grows and grows and grows. So there's, no, there's no guarantee that, it's, uh, that it has finite state, right? But I only need to keep a summary of the previous and the current state. Right? And, and I need to keep, so this, these are sets of tuples, and I, I need to tell you how to efficiently keep them. Yes. Right, but if you have an infinite uh, prefix mm -hmm. and the property is not satisfied and you're searching it. Right. right. So that would uh, lead to I mean, it would, would not terminate such an So so again I and mean, that that goes back to I think my second slide. Uh, that's why I restricted myself to safety. So I would have a problem there. Therefore, usually in runtime verification, that's what you do. You check the safety property, and if it fails, a safety property has the property that if it fails, it cannot be fixed anymore. It already failed. And other things, runtime verification can't really check. Right? We can check co-safety, which is not so interesting. The other you have to check just the safety component. Uh -huh. What will happen? My laptop original language is Hebrew, so left and right is reversed. <laughs> so I'm going to represent sets using VDDs. Okay, so if I want to represent uh, now D and Q and R and VDD, that's another VDD. Okay, I assume you know VDD, right? So, so it's a compact representation, and I have like a positive arch would be uh, in, in uh, full line and negative <coughs> line, if zero. If P is zero, if it's not P, then I'll have a dotted line, okay? And then to tell you whether it's true or false. And BDD has very nice compaction usually, so it's a very nice representation. Uh, but that's not the only reason. But, but what, you know, the, the first reason I use BDD is that I get a lot of values I get lots of values, and uh, you know, since the set of values grows and grows and grows, I hope the VDD would compact it. Right? So I don't like to expose. Okay, how I'm going to complement the set? So if you look at this formula, in fact, an uh, implication is not close F or P open F. So an implication inherently uh, contains a complementation. Right. So let's see what happened. These are the values that I saw so far, right? So all these values. Some I saw with close and some I saw with open. Okay? And what I, I need to say is not close. All the values which are not close, okay? Uh, what values are not close, okay? So 
These are the values which are not tel2, right? That includes tel, zinc, and up. These are the values that are open. They are not closed. But in fact, these are not only the values that are not closed. That's all the values that I didn't see, right? right? And that's the set I want to maintain. So, so I need my representation to represent that set, OK? Because I need to be able to talk about infinite, uh, infinite uh, set of values. I'll show later that sometimes I want to talk about finite ones, so I'll, I'll, I'll do both. So what's going to happen is my representation is the following. I'm not going to hold the data directly. I'm going to actually put the data in hash table, but I'm going to keep in the BDD an enumeration of the values that I see. So the first value that I see, I'll give it the value 0, 0, 0, 0. The second value, I'm going to give 0, 0, 0, 1. The third, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, OK? And I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to have a hash table so that if I see the same value, Right? I'm not going to assign a new enumeration to it, but I'm going to be able to you know, retrieve the previous enumeration. So, so maybe here the assumption that you don't have function symbols is relevant. I mean, you, your, mm -hmm. your terms have only constants and the variable, right? So this is true. OK, so I keep pressing that, hoping that I will move my slide. That's not going to happen. So here, open. Open tell, tell got the value 0, 0, 0, 7, you read it, dict uh, 0, 0, 1, out is 0, 0, <coughs> and close is enumerated as 0, 1, 1. Okay? Now, the fact that I, I enumerate them, right, in binary allows me to keep them in the BDDs, but the fact that I enumerate them also helps me because. I enumerate them sequentially in the, in the order I see them, and a lot of time that would give me a very compact DVD. Yes. Very okay, so open would contain, you know, the set open would contain uh, these three <coughs> values, right? These are the ones which are open, okay? And I need that because uh, P of open would include the, the three, right? So it would accumulate. The set semantics would include all these three values, right? And then I'll have a BDD that represents, you know, P of open. P of open would accumulate, right? So from state to state, there would be, you know, it would add another value, another value, another value. And you get a BDD that hopefully corresponds to that formula. Okay. Now let's see something interesting. Uh, I enumerated for open uh, values from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 1, 0. I have three bits, right? So, so I have eight possibilities. And I did not enumerate anything which is uh, equal, bigger or equal than the enumeration 1, 0, 0, right? That's 4, right? This is the fifth enumeration I started from 0, okay? So what happened is that automatically all the values which I did not enumerate, they correspond to all the values that I didn't see. And that, I think, is the, is the nicest trick in, in this world, right? So, in fact, that allows me to use the infinite state space. I'll show this some more bits to that trick, right? But automatically, what would happen is that uh, these values, right? These enumerations, the big enumerations, in this case, they return false. The other would return true. But if I apply all the operators, all the BDD operators on them, like if I'm going to negate them, they would be true and the other one would be, would be false. And they would always correspond to what would happen with all the other values that I did not see. So this is, BDD is actually a representation of an infinite state space. Right? In particular, so this, this is BDD again. In particular, okay, uh, I have the last enumeration, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. 
Okay, in this case it's one, 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 because I have three beats. Sha uh, one is always representing all the values that I did not see. Okay, maybe there's others because you know in this case it's from one zero zero, but this one in particular is all the values I did not see. And I need to make sure that I would never enumerate on one 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 one, right? So my enumeration would not go as far as that. If it would go as far as that, then I need to do something. Then the BDD is not big enough, it's not wide enough, right? Okay. Now if I want to complement the BDDs. Uh, very easy, right? So, uh, PDD's operation is very easy. I just replace the true and the false, and then that's the complement. And again, that would correspond also to what I do with this value 111. It's going to always. Okay, so, so I have, you know, first order logic over infinite state space. Okay, now what happens if, if this is not sufficient, right? So, suppose indeed that I allocated. Uh, n bits, okay, if I allocated n bits, notice that I can have 2 to the power of n values, right? that's a lot of values, right? So in many cases, you know, uh, we, we calculated that, you know, there would be, you know, light years before n values would be, uh, would, you know, would be filled, but if we want to work with little values, with, with a little amount of bits, okay, Notice that the size of the BDD could grow actually up to 2 to the power of n. It could be a really big BDD, and we trust the BDD to be compact. It works when the BDD is compact. If you know you get all kinds of complicated things, this would explode, right? So it has the potential to explode. But if you know I just allocated 5 bits because I'm really stingy, and now I, I have 2 to the power of 5 values, okay, different values that I see. What do I do? Well, I could extend that and I can have another bit. Adding another bit, I double the number of values that I can use, okay? How do I add another bit? Uh, there's two possibilities. If the extra bit, the most significant bit is zero, that's just copying the BDD because it's just adding the leading zero. If the extra bit is one, the leading bit is one, uh, these are values that I did not see so far. So they all have the same value as this guy, 11111. So it's just writing a BDD formula, and I can extend the BDD on the fly as much as I need. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. So yes. this clause, for example, in NASA, people say this FDIR things are, are like the most, uh, they need to be very, uh, they need to be, be designed in an extreme robust way. And then uh, are they comfortable with using BDDs on their satellites? That's sort of like a question I should say. I, I believe this is the first time that people use BDD for anti-verification. And this is a new work. Whether they're comfortable or not, we hope so. But this, this is completely new, right? I just presented in a conference a few days ago. Uh, and it looks like it works very well, right? Uh, we believe that uh, this kind of two to the power of n thing, uh, we believe that First of all, that the BDDs would be compact, and we believe that uh, it goes a long way. You know, the, the values is not so many values. You can have billions and billions of values before you, you, you need more bits. Again, depending on the compactness. We have examples where, uh, maybe I'll say it in a summary. So, so there's, there's all, all kinds of little problems of what happened if it explodes, etc. And we, we have partial solutions for that. But I'm not sure yet that, you know, this this only in fact that was released during you know during the, uh, the review time they started to say we want to see the system. And that was not released by NASA. Klaus had to run and tell NASA the program committee wants to see the the, the tool. NASA immediately released it. So it's brand brand new. It's okay. So, uh, so now, now I have uh, more than one variable, right? So more than one variable, right? So suppose I can have like tuples, and I have to take care of tuples, and again, that's not a problem because I'm going to assign bits uh, to any BDD, so I can enumerate, say, A as zero and B as one. And for a different domain, I can use 
Um, I can enumerate from scratch or I can enumerate uh, consecutively. It's more efficient if I enumerate from scratch. <coughs> I'll just play why not. Uh, and then I get double. So I get uh, 0, 0, 0 goes with 0, 0, 0, and B goes with 52. And I get these BDDs with just uh, twice as many uh, bits. And that represents the two possibilities. And that extends everything that, that I said. Uh, so now let's go back to this, okay? Let's go back to this. This is my semantics. And now, basically, uh, my representation, what I need here is, is basically, this is a set of assignments, right? Assignments are tuples of different sizes, or I could extend them all to the full sizes, right? For, for all the variables. Uh, and, and this is assuming if I extend all the assignments to the same sizes, Okay, to, to have all the variables, if I want, I, I don't have to do that. And basically, this is a set of assignment, and what does it mean to do an intersection of sets of assignment represented as BDD? It's a conjunction, it's a BDD conjunction, and this is a BDD disjunction, right? And this, you know, complementation is just a complementation of BDDs. The exist is you know, you apply existing BDDs by bit by bit. So this actually gives you an algorithm, and the algorithm is very, very similar to the algorithm of the propositional case. Only that instead of working with bits, I work with BDDs, right? So here's my algorithm, right? I only have to keep track of uh, basically two versions, right, now and Pre, okay. So pre would uh, pre would correspond to the BDD that represents the assignments in the previous state, and now represents the BDD corresponding to the assignment in the current state. And then I apply the BDD operators and or exist. That's all, right? So the algorithm at the end looks very much like the propositional algorithm, right? Although I think you saw I made a lot, a lot of work in order to make it look like that. Um, and and that's, that's how the system works. Okay, so notice how similar this is, right? So that line, it's very much like this. This is an OR of, of now, of now of phi, um, right? And there's an N of now of phi. And uh, the pre of, of phi since phi. Only that now these are BDDs and not just plain bits. Uh, when I have something like there exists x uh, such that I did not, uh, that uh, basically it's not the case that I saw g of x, then there's different interpretation whether I say uh, that uh, this corresponds to the x's that I saw or this corresponds to all the x's that I may want to see. That these are different semantics. Okay? So far I, I assume that the negation corresponds to all the infinite values. But maybe I want to say these are just those that I saw. I did not see that. So that, for that we need to do something else. We need to basically build a BDD that has, you know, it corresponds to all the enumeration that I saw so far, and we need to relativize properties, existential universal uh, quantification, relativize to this bit uh, predicate. So I can do that, right? It's different semantics. If you want to do this, you do that. If you want to do this, you do that. Another possibility is that you want to say, ah, you work so hard for infinite domains, but maybe you have finite domains. You really want to have finite domains. No problem. Uh, I'm going to encode, you know, uh, the ability to say that um, the enumeration is smaller than some value. Okay, and again the same trick. I'm going to relativize the existential and universal quantification with that predicate. And now I can also work with finite domain if you wish to do that. Will you keep a comparison over the speed, for example? Because every step that you do seems to take time if you have large BDDs, right? and you want to do long-time verification. 
I'm just wondering, uh, do you give a uh, time comparison? Yes. So the implementation, this is true. Uh, this was written in NASA by Klaus, um, Klaus wrote that. Uh, I, I wrote part of it in, in, uh, in uh, ML. Um, what, is it? What, what is it called? Deja vu? The previous work with power? Or? No, deja vu because we, it's something. Ah, uh, okay. It's <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I wrote. Part of it, you know, I, I promise him, although he is the great champion programmer, I promise I'm going to write something. So I wrote some structural things in ML, and then he took that and uh, but basically he wrote most of it and, and changed my ML into uh, Stella, but, but he actually wrote most, most, most of it. Um, so here, here's one of his properties, the property access, right? And this is how it is translated, right? Um, okay. Translated into some, um, right, some expressions. Uh, the input is given in uh, CSV, which is common separated value format. So that means that the first value is the, the predicate name, and uh, these are the parameters. Okay. This is the way the input goes. Uh, in the implementation, in fact, uh, Klaus uh, wanted that in every state there's only one event. Um, that's how it works with the other system that he has. Uh, I have no explanation for that, but that's a difference between the theory which every state could have many events mm -hmm. and the implementation, that's how it works. And there is some there is an explanation to that, but I don't know. I guess in NASA you don't. Uh, he used Java BDD, which he could tie easily into uh, into uh, Scala. Okay, uh, and there's you know I, I think this is the most popular BDD package. Um, works. Um, it has some syntax, right? This is previous time. This is the syntax of our formula. And, and here's another. So I told you about this formula access that. Remember that because that's our first case study to give the comparison that you asked before. The second case study is a uh, less complicated property. It says that for every uh, file f, um, if I close f, then I, I open f with some mode. Okay, it's a simpler property. And this is how it's going to translate, right? So it's going to translate to disk operators. You know, here you see the pre and now, and everything. And that corresponds to that tree, right? And that's the tree which is compiled from that formula. So in fact, you first run uh, visual and it generates from your monitor, and then you run the monitor. And then you see this input, right? So you see these, these are three lines, three events. Uh, as I said, this is CSV, so it's open with the parameter input and read, open with the parameter output and write, and the third event is closed with the parameter out. So you get the first line, okay, so you say it open. This is the enumeration uh, for uh, open with, uh, read, with, with input and read that gives you this simple PDD. Uh, then P, previous, Previous includes now, right? So the value for the BDD of 4 and the value of BDD of 5 are the same, okay? Um, exists really mean projection, so I'm going to project uh, all the, uh, the values of them, right? So it's the BDD before project. I did not see close, so it's false. Uh, then trivially, this sub formula calculated to true. So that's for the first event, right? And then go to the second event. Oops, too fast. Uh, that opens another file right output with the node right, and it goes the same, right? So open. Uh, now that is the combination of the previous BDD and this BDD. It's a union of that because it's a pass of two things. 
Uh, then this was the projection. Uh, close again. I didn't know it took that. Here's, here's uh, the third one. I didn't know open, so that gets closed. Uh, right? So this is a copy of the previous, what happened previously, the previous open. Uh, this is the projection again. Now I close, so I enumerate the value. Uh, I, I, I build a big review of the value f, which was enumerated actually before, and I calculate that. And in fact, since I uh, close something that I did not open, that would calculate false and check those. And then everything else is in Java, right? So that means uh, that I am able to, for example, say, because this appears to be super powerful that we can put it into a cloud to say that whenever someone triggers something, he needs to be authenticated before. Yeah. So this, this, this is written, you know, the, the, this is actually written in, in Scalar. Okay. It's connected to the Java package. Okay. But it could have been um, written in, in Java. So here's, uh, here is the property access. Remember that's the first property. The second property is the one I showed you before in the graph. Uh, sorry, first property is access. The second property is the one I showed you in the graph. This is a property which says that, um, yeah, this is access again. And, and this is a more complicated property. This says that the events happen in, in, in uh, their open and closing in a, in a five-fold order. So these are the three properties, and now uh, I'm going to do the comparison. So we compared the only other, uh, the only other work we know about doing first order uh, runtime verification of first order uh, logic is a logic called Monopoly, and it is from NTA. It's from the group of David Basin. It exists for some years. Uh, the principle of that system is different, so it's written in ML. Uh, it's, it's a rather large system. And it has two versions, uh, one which allows infinite state space and one which is finite. I think the current version is finite, it's, I don't know why. Um, it works with a different principle. So they use database operators and they use automata. Okay? Uh, we try to look at their code, the code is huge. Uh, so I'm not sure how exactly they implement the automata and, and the stuff. Uh, and, and we just wanted to compare. So these are the three examples. Access, uh, you remember that's the first example. File is the simple one. And FIFO is a complicated one. And we run it with different trace lengths. These are the trace lengths, uh, kind of uh, more than 10,000 to them, more than 100,000, more than a million. And here it's more or less 5,000 to them. 10,000 events, and this is the comparison between QTL and Monopoly, where here we use with different width of, of DVDs, right? Uh, so, um, here Monopoly was quicker, and here we were more quicker, and um, here we were more than 1,000 times quicker. <laughs> And the file is the same. Uh, the longer the length is, one party started to, to go pretty slow, and, and our system was very, very quick. DNF means, oh, I don't know, it's the way. it means we, we run out of patience. I think we just turn it off after two days. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, with the FIFO example, uh, we found out that. Uh, Monopoly was somewhat quicker than us, and in fact, when we use uh, uh, 10,000 events, right, longer sequence, then we actually run out of memory. So here, actually, we get different kind of error, uh, but in both cases, in fact, what happens is we run out of memory. We, we kind of analyze what happened and why this is, and we, we have all kinds of ideas of, of what to do next. Or some cases we don't have an ease of what to do next, so it's a matter of research. But it really means that uh, in many cases we're, we're so much faster, like by, by a factor of 1,000, up to 3,000 times, in fact. Uh, in some cases we're slower. Uh, so again, the answer is BDD could explode, right? 
Uh, we have all kinds of ideas of how to um, reuse memory in the BBD. This is for the next paper. Okay. We have all kinds of ideas why this one is slow, okay, why this is a bad example for BDDs. Uh, and, and I think that's an interesting research. Let me conclude. Uh, so there's pros and cons. The pros of the system is it's very compact. It's <coughs> Present to the power of k values, right? So we can represent a lot of values. If you think that you're going to send a you know a space mission and, and it's going to have a million values, you need you know log and BDD like log and bits. But of course, the size of BDD will grow. Um, so so we we actually found that we pay very little by the <coughs> surplus bits. So you know why don't you just include more bits? But if you don't want to use more bits, then you can, as I showed, add bits dynamically. I showed this trick where you add another bit and double it with uh, the number of, of, of events you can use. Complementation is efficient. Um, and, and I think this is the nicest trick that the value you didn't see represent uh, the values that, you know, uh, the big um, enumeration and values represent values that you didn't see. So that's a trick and it allows you to represent infinite state space and in a very efficient way. So I think many people thought about to do that with all kinds of things. You take, take care of this case and that case. But what happened if you didn't see that value intersected with all these values that you did see with that variable? It gives you a lot of possibilities when we started to think about this. It's a very complicated problem, right? So you may have seen X, but you may have not seen Y. So there could be a lot of possibilities. And we have to solve it in, in a kind of a one fell swoop way by representing you know, the uh, larger enumeration as the ones you didn't see. And it is expandable. And, and, and nothing to think about it anymore. It just the cons, uh, the problem, uh, we can only you know, compare values. We cannot do anything. <coughs> uh, we cannot perform computations, and, and, and we cannot say interesting things about relations. OK, uh, one body actually, uh, to some extent, can, can have this capability, but it pays by Execution time because it used data text. That's it. <coughs> <coughs>
get a value and then they spawn an automaton with that value, they do not have the power of first order logics. All this trick with the intersections, they cannot do that. Right? So so this is this is important. Uh, and the other the only other system that can do that is Monopoly, which I think is much, much slower than, than this one. Uh, so so I think it burns his, it in his bones to do that. You know, we made and he, he, when he told me this is what we want to do, you know, I, I, I felt like and it's, this is the problem we really want. So, well, so let's just have one last question because we're a little bit out of time.